one. So a lot of you guys were asking, like, does Zach wear the same shirt and the same hat in every video? And the answer is yes, because the sponsor of this video, the Digital Factory Mastermind program, you guys want to click that link, go to the landing page. In the very first video I want you guys to watch, I'm actually wearing this, this shirt, this hat. So it's about familiarity. So when you go click that link, go see the sponsor of today's video. Um, sorry, Dan. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So click that first link in the description. Go check out the Digital Factory Mastermind program. We had a new sign up yesterday. That was really awesome. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you for joining today's live stream. We go live every week on Tuesdays at noon central. We have a community spotlight today, Dan Riken, and we have Walker Reynolds on the live stream today. Thank you guys for joining. Dan, welcome. Dan, you might have to unmute now. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds like you it sounded like you were playing our live stream in the background there and it kind of threw me off. <laughs> uh, Dan, you're still muted. I'm technically challenged. <laughs> so Dan is a member of our mentorship program and we really wanted to have him actually no, Dan is now a member of our mastermind program. Excuse me. <laughs> so, uh, Dan, tell us a little bit about where you are and what you do, and uh, then I'll kick it over to Walker to ask a follow-up question. Cool. So, um, I'm at a stage of my life where I realized I haven't done everything I want to do, and automation is what interests me. And so, I've been pursuing a path in automation for the last four years, fairly serious. Uh, got involved with a wastewater water treatment company. There's 70 sites I have some responsibility for in California. And so I use that as my training ground to apply these new concepts. And every day I need to learn more. And it turned out LinkedIn was a great place to get to know people. LinkedIn. So that's how you found us? Yeah. Walker and I connected on August 17th. And since then, of all the members of the community, I would say I probably talked to Dan, probably three. I talked to, oh, well, I talked to Dan and Mario definitely the most. And then probably Dave Schultz after this, so Mario Shigawa, um, Dan Riken, Dave Schultz, and then probably Andrew Ott is probably number four that I talked to the most. But I talked to Dan the most for sure. We probably touch base every week to 10 days yeah. or so. Um, yeah. And, and Dan has had a lot of, I, Dan has been a, you've provided a lot of contribution to the community around philosophy, like a philosophy and attitude and the Rule, types of attitude it takes, right. To, to, you know, you, you're part of the Saturday, you guys meet every other Saturday, right? You guys, yes. there's a study group that meets every other Saturday. You guys call it the war room now. Is that the, well, that the it's, um, it's, I call it study group one, but as those of the group that have gone into practical, they move over to the war room and they get pretty serious about the nitty gritty. And that's, and that's just a little beyond where I'm at in the program. Okay. And so where are you in terms of mentorship? Where, where, where are you phase wise? You're in step uh, one. Phase wise, I'm uh, about halfway through my step one curriculum. I had, um, I'll call them obstacles or challenges at work, things that had to take priority. I was part-time when Zach had me sign up. And then oh, I got okay. full-time and it's like, oh, darn. I mean, you know, look, full-time's good, right? No real complaint other than now I have to allot a different, you know, set of hours to do the, to do the curriculum. So you're, you're different than, well, you're not totally different, right? So John Sindrich and you are similar in that John – has a John has a background in industry, but he's a he's a quality guy who's moving over to industry 4.0, right? What tell us a little bit about your background? So, what is your professional background, and and what drove you towards automation? You know, midway through your career, or late later in your career. Uh, a good question, well stated. So. Some of the best parts of my life occasionally was when I started a software company and uh, we were very successful for 16 years and look, not all of it was a bed of roses. There was ups and downs and there was times that I almost lost it a couple times. And so, but I've had to learn how to make payroll and how to stay focused and 
make the right decisions, make all the correct decisions to stay alive. And whether I made all the right decisions or not, I'm not able to tell you for sure, but I did stay alive for 16 years. We were the biggest of the little guys in our realm. And what I have the skill of doing is knowing what the product needed to do to make the next customer say yes. And I believe in industry 4.0, my instinct is going to be valuable. And so, so what it, what's the, if you had to boil down what you've learned so far, so since August, September, when you started engaging with the community, if you had to boil it down to a point, what is the, what's the, the one big takeaway or let, and, and if, if one is too difficult, what are the two big takeaways? Oh, wow. So my wow. mind saw an orchestra with everybody playing an instrument and some of them were on different notes learning how to get rid of all the sour noted instruments first, getting able to take away all the people that don't know how to, how to hit, you know, the A, like the concert master is expecting, eliminating all them. And in short, if they don't agree with Walker, they are now suspect in my view. That's awesome. <laughs> Mario, Mario Shigawa said in the, uh, in the, um, chat that you know everyone and you introduce those that should be connected what what, what i would argue th this is how i describe dan dan is you and i are kindred spirits right yes. um from a like a emotional spiritual level we're kindred spirits right and and that's where my connect i mean they're all the technical stuff you know that in in terms of our relationship that's ancillary right it, it it's a deeper you know, spiritual connection that I, you know, I have, have with you and, and that we've sort of riffed off of, you know, yes. and you've provided a ton of great, you know, you're, if, if we were going to create, you know, the group, your group of guys that all get together, if we were, if we, when we were sitting down and we were saying, Hey, listen, we want to foster this community. That's what we, when Zach, myself, Zach and Vaughn sat down and said, Hey, let's do the discord server. And we we're talking about this like in July or whatever. And we said, let's, let's, we want to foster a community. If we, at that time, it was only a concept. It was an idea that, of, you know, if you build it, they will come and will attract all the right, you know, moth to a flame and all that stuff. You, you guys in that group, you and the, and the group of guys, that core group of guys that you're a part of are, that's the reality that we were trying to work to, you know what I mean? And, and so it, and it, it it's incredibly refreshing. I mean, it really makes us feel you know, like we're making a difference that this community really is making a difference. And if you look at the, the growth of the, the discord server and that community, the, a, the fact that we've been able to keep it valuable to engineers. One of the biggest things when we were talking about this was, you know, you're going to end up with a bunch of sales guys in there trying to sell to everybody. I mean, that's, what's going to end up happening. And how can we manage, how can we make it so that you're, we're, you know, engineers aren't inundated with, business development guys trying to sell them something. I think that's what our contribution has been is that we've been able to moderate it so that it, it, it's valuable to engineers. And I think now we broke 1100 members of the discord server. Critical mass. Like yeah. in the last few weeks, it's really started to grow where it was more so us being more active to where now the community has really outpaced us. Yeah, you that's know? right. The community, right. We don't, we were originally driving it and now we're not, now we're just moderating. Right. And now what we're really doing is looking for the people in the community, the Mario's of the world and the Dave's and the Dan's and the John Sindriches, et cetera, et cetera, that, that are going to help scale, right? They, you know, the, be, you know, take a bigger role as members of the community, right? Leading the community. But Dan, with you, you know, so now you've had four or five months of this development in industry 4.0. How do you see it applying to your career for the rest of 2021. So the, right, you're in, you're in digital mastermind now. So you're going through mastermind and mentorship at the same time. How do you, where do you see your career going, the, your career arc over say the next year, the next 12 months as a function of what you're learning through the community? In water and wastewater, the sites that have alarms when the alarms go off, that usually means, hey, 
get a truck rolling. Well, you know, that's talking about a $500 cost. Is it necessary? Uh, and I've got some 70 sites. <clears throat> it is in my vision that all 70 sites will be on a dashboard so that when my boss wakes up in the morning, he sees the dashboard, <laughs> he can hit snooze. And this is a little different, Walker, than maybe you would have expected, but I have to see the world through, the, through what's ahead of me. Some of these sites do not have high-end skaters. Some of them have, <laughs> some of them have, <laughs> We, we deactivated this one, but up until about six months ago, we had a Radio Shack dialer calling our answering service. So we, you know, there was some improvements that I was able to help generate. And whether the information from the sites is coming real time, it's not as important as my boss being able to see that the dashboard, as of all we know, what is the source of truth to now that we can detect? How does it look from there? And little by little by little, I intend to be using a UNS type framework and get it real time. In any case, this is my passion. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, anything else you want to cover? Anything else you want to uh, you want to uh, talk about? Or uh, I, I'd like for you to stay on on this meeting the whole time. That way, if the you want to contribute, well, while, while I'm answering you questions, came up with the rule of Borg. That's right. Yes. Well, one of the things that if you talk about Dan, you guys will notice in my one note at the top, I have the rule of Borg, which is what any nodes know, all nodes know. And that that's actually a quote from Dan. Dan is the one. So for those of you that rule of Borg, that's a Star Trek term, right? So the Borg was um, like an up, upper level intelligence species that was all interconnected. Basically what any, what any, what any one, node new in the Borg ecosystem, all nodes new, right? And, and Dan actually sent that quote saying, Hey, that's what the, the, the UNS is. It's, it's the rule of Borg, right? What any nodes know, all nodes know. I use the term, the unified namespace is omniscient and omnipresent. That's how I describe it. That is omniscient. It knows everything and omnipresent it's everywhere. And so when people ask me, where does the unified namespace live? Well, it lives everywhere. It every it, it, if it's set up correctly, you can have many, many, many instances of the unified namespace um, that in real time all have the exact same uh, structure and events. All right. Um, and in SQL Server terms, imagine you had always on replication of your database to unlimited nodes in your ecosystem. So I could hit many different endpoints instead of using like a virtual host name i could hit many many databases that all have exactly the same values at the exact same time that is the unified namespace dan is the one who gave us the term what any nodes know all nodes know and you'll notice it's at the top of of my slide uh each week and that came from dr Riken over here <laughs> lieutenant dan is how i'm affectionately referred to Lu lieutenant dan it is Lieutenant Dan, so, it is. Uh, Walker, if I might add to that, the um, it took me a little courage to write you that email about the rule of board because it, 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 there's a vulnerable aspect of me that had to be presented to explain it. Number one, believe it or not, I have never seen the Star Trek episode where this oh. is discussed. It, okay. I, it, 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 I have a, you know, a, a resistance is futile. I get that. But where it came from, and it wasn't named instantly, but where it came from was in my software company, there came a time where I had to leave for an extended period of time and I did not want to go. And I was scared, but I knew that I had to go and I had to prepare my employees to operate in my absence. And so there was several things that I had to take a risk with that I never would have mm -hmm. otherwise. Right. Um, one of the things that I did to prepare for today was to, was to review once again, your core values, because your, your introduction was correct. You and I have, there's, there's an affinity that we have for similar beliefs, even as different as we are. Yeah. There's it, um, 
and so transparency fits the rule of board. So here I'm stealing now your, your five core values to say, no, that's actually in there. It's in the rule of board. Authenticity, humility, a faith-based servant leadership. Now, here's how that would apply. The rule of board wasn't meant from a religious basis. It was a meant from an efficiency basis. If one of my employees knew something that would make it go better for another employee, in my absence, that information had to get there, and I wasn't going to be the one carrying the water. That's right. And so I had to teach them to do that. Um, and, you know, I guess we can say I was lucky to learn it, and then in time I coined the phrase, uh, and it sat on the shelf for over a decade. It was totally useless information until I met Walker. I've read that email probably 50 times. I read it to my you're, kids. You're I read it to my wife. Emails after this, Walker. What's that? You're probably going to get a ton of emails from our community <laughs> member after I, this. Yeah, I, 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 and actually I messaged Dan right afterwards and I'm like, man, I'm really, I, I'm very, very thankful you sent, this made my day. I'm incredibly thankful you sent this. By the way, this is how much of a Star Trek nerd I am. I believe the Borg is introduced in, in Star Trek The Next Generation in Season 1, Episode 16. And I want somebody to check and see if that's the case. But I, I'm almost certain... I know the name one, of the episode is Q-Who. Q-Who. It's Q-Who, right? Q-Who. Q -who. Yep. Yeah. Q-Who. That's how much of a Star Trek nerd I am. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right, great, Dan. Thank you. I, please stay on the Zoom call, and and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go through my normal uh, question and answer session. So, Dan and, Bryken, thank you very very much. One yeah, of the things I want to say to the community is, you know, uh, by the way, this is the rule of Borg here at the top. Uh, that you know, Dan is if, if there is there are very few people in the community I would argue are more approachable than Dan is. So. Um, you know, especially for those people who are trying to find their place in the community, trying to find their place, you know, in this, this fourth industrial revolution, how it is that we're going to help manufacturers leverage technology to do more with less. Dan is, is the guy I would have the first conversation with, if I'm being honest with you. And the reason why is because it wasn't that long ago when Dan didn't know where his place was. And, and, and some of us will feel like we've had it figured out for a long time. Right. And, and, and Dan, he, he, he doesn't feel like he's had it figured out for a long time when it comes to industry 4.0. So that, that in, and there isn't a more approachable person in the community. And I, I truly appreciate your contribution, man. I mean it. Um, oh, just to fact check you Walker. It was season two, episode 16. Oh, season two, episode 16. Okay. Right. Dang it. Um, I knew it was episode 16. I don't know why I knew that. But I did. Um, all right. Uh, episode, uh, discord. So we're at 1109 members, um, as of today. Uh, the interesting stat there is that actually more than half of those members, the 1109 members are active at least once a week. That's the, that's a, that's the most crazy number to me is that we've got over 550 people on the, who are members of the server who are active at least one time per week on the server. That is, they've uh, either posted, liked, you know, emoticon or whatever. Um, this week, we're shooting a podcast called The Economics of Industry 4.0 for service providers and end users. Okay, so what that means is we are going, we're going to shoot a podcast that is going to explain how it is that end users and service providers, so that's systems integrators and OEMs, the how they benefit economically from the fourth industrial revolution, right? There's so many questions I get related to, well, if what you're doing, like our, this is probably the most common question I get. By, by designing these architectures, aren't you basically engineering out the role of the systems integrator? I mean, I get that question all the time. And so part of the, the, the podcast will be to address that. The answer is, no, in fact, we're creating. You're creating all, new markets completely. What what end? What it means is that systems integrators are going to stop doing, you know, point to point integrations, and they're going to start doing 
you know, distributed integrations. That's really what it means. Um, the other thing we're, we're currently editing the free wave video, the re the review video. Um, I feel terrible for this. We, we shot, I shot the open box videos and all of the development videos for free wave, I think in November, end of, end of November. And then because of, yeah, I think it was in the end of November, uh, we've got, and then we didn't, and then I, I, we have to shoot a five minute finish, you know, uh, but we're currently editing all the free wave stuff. So there's a big free wave edge zoom edge review video that we're releasing. We, we, hell, we wanted to release it in December, but you know, the schedules have just, it's just not been good to us. Um, uh, we received the PLC next. So for those of you guys who don't know, um, Phoenix contact has, uh, an IOT platform, um, a, a whole IOT ecosystem called PLC next. Um, and they sent to both myself and Zach, they sent, uh, review units for us. So we're going to be doing a comprehensive review of the technology right down to the software, the PLC next store avail available on their website and, and the hardware. So, uh, tell them, I tell them our idea with the two PLC next. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we are going to separately integrate the two PLC next into the same unified ecosystem, him and Phoenix, here. me here in Dallas. We're going to yeah, do that the, together. I got the one, one he's right got in here. his closet. And here's the one I, the one I've got right here. And then they sent a bunch of IO and, um, thank you. Ira sharp shout out. He's in the discord, um, for shipping us these units. Thank you. He also has a really cool podcast that he did with, uh, uh, I think it was Ravi or one of the, uh, he does the automation. Uh, he does like automation content. I'll link it below, but it was a really good podcast. And my thoughts process when, after I listened to that podcast, you know, Phoenix contact had been wanting to, you know, ship us these units for a while. And finally, I got yeah, it was probably, to, they probably reached out like beginning of last summer or something. It was a long time ago. I finally got around to listening to this podcast. I'm like, wow, these guys get it. These guys have been listening like it. They're part of the community. So thank you, Ira. And just so you guys know, Ira totally respects the fact that we have to remain impartial. There's been there's no quid pro quo. There's no we're not being compensated in any way, shape or form. Um, he you know, Ira and his team believe so much in their technology that they're you know, they're not let, they they believe in that technology so much. They're willing to put it through the, the gauntlet, which um, you guys know me that if if it's if I'm not satisfied, everyone's going to know I'm not satisfied with it. But I, I do feel obligated to give them a plug because this is obviously thousands of dollars worth of hardware that they shipped out. Um, although the pricing on the PLC Next is incredibly competitive. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really, really surprised on the pricing. But I do want to read the, the thing. So they sent a lot of, you know, swag, uh, you know, Yeti. They sent uh, a bottle opener, a hat, and you know all that, all the stuff they normally send. But um, the technology is pretty impressive. Um, you know, software is downloadable. I don't know if you guys. Well, let me ask you this: How many of you guys have used um, Phoenix Contact PLCs in the past? I have not used their PLCs, but I have been extensive use of their power supplies, redundancy modules, and all of their terminal blocks and things of that nature. So I'm only test drove the software. I have not. This this will be my first test drive on the the actual PLC Next units, the PLC units themselves. But they're full IIoT out of the box. So, but uh, basically, this is how they describe it on the card that they sent to me, which was uh, PLC Next technology is the ecosystem for industrial automation, the combination of open control platform, which is one of the the only reason I consider doing this is because the control platform is open. That's the only reason I agreed to do it. Um, modular engineering software, digital software marketplace enables easy adaptation to changing demands and the efficient utilization of existing and future software services. What they mean there is that the community can collaborate with objects through their the, the online store. Um, and due to simple cloud integration, the possibility of using open source software and the constantly growing know-how of the user community PLC next technology is able to meet all challenges of the IOT world. That is remain to be remains to be seen. We are definitely going to put it through the, the ringer and then we'll let you guys know what we think. Um, go ahead, Zach. So I do want to share, like when I was kind of first learning, I was talking to, um, uh, one of the, I was talking to 
uh, Ira about some of the features and he put me in contact with one of the technical engineers and he was answering a few of my questions talking about how it can run any code. And I was like, oh, that kind of, to me, it sounds like the Opto 22 Groove Epic. Right. It's like, yeah, you know, same, same approach, same boat. But yep. I think the pricing on the, on the PLC Next is- Way more competitive. Yeah, it's a different- yep. Kind of but model, the big but thing, the you, yeah, the the PLC next is 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 uh, you know is um, between it's going to fall between the it's going to be in the price point between easy automation and opto. It's going to be in that price point in the middle. So it's going to be it you know the pricing is very very. I mean, you know, not we're expect we're going to give a full review. So expect that after the yep. review. and then we'll probably do a podcast and and invite Ira and his his group on. Uh, same thing we're doing with free wave. Um, all right. The other thing is this Friday, we have the digital transformation maturity assessment webinar at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, so far we got 275 people who've signed up. Is that the most we've ever had free register for an event? The most we ever had was frameworks university at like over 500. So, okay. Um, I, you guys can see, I don't pay attention to all those, um, but this one's but, gonna be really big. This one is this one's different than frameworks. You'll want to attend because it's gonna be unlisted after. This is if you're in our mastermind program, you'll get access to not only the recording on Friday, but also more. But because we wanted to let everyone's been asking us how do we do digital transformation maturity assessments, we decided to do a free one hour training. So attend live, and then after that, it'll be unavailable. So the this session is all about what is a, a digital transformation maturity assessment. So we're going to talk about what it is within for all of you guys who are members of mentorship and digital mastermind. What is a digital transformation maturity assessment and how does it fit in our steps to digital transformation? We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about what do we, what do we do when we're doing the assessment? What, is, what are all the steps? Who do you talk to? What questions do you ask? We're going to do that at a probably a 10,000 to 5,000 foot view because we got to get everything in in one hour. But the, you know, there are, there are also, we're not, we're not going to, right. We're not publishing the link, right? That's the idea. Yeah. After it's the gonna stream. It's going to be kind of similar to how the digital mastermind webinar was, except right now, if you put in your email, you can watch the free one hour mastermind webinar. But this one, it's just going to be live once. Uh, I did, someone did say they're in like, uh, it's going to be like 2 a.m. for them. So I said, we'll leave the the link on the registration page or on the, the page for 24 hours. So if you, uh, you want to attend live. Mr. Momontos, uh, interested in the capabilities of precision time control and time sensitive network on PLC Next. Yes, that's on my list for testing already. Good question. Um, all right. So let's get to our, let's get to our questions. We're going to start with uh, Mario uh, Ishikawa. He asked regarding OEE. This is a great question, by the way, Mario. Get it all the time. <clears throat> regarding OEE, he, you've, I've seen plants calculating the area OEE as the average of its lines OEE, as well as the new calculation um, from a sum of all machines. Indicators like sum of available all time, plan downtime, sum of all machine production, divided by the sum of all machine ideal production. Which one is more correct or more accepted? Okay, so to give a little context, context here, so in the ISC 95 World Enterprise site that your plant area, line, cell, right? What he's saying is, is when I've got, you know, I have OEE calculated at my production line. Can you blow it up a little bit? Can you blow it up a little bit? Yeah. Um, or actually, let me just change the font size. All right. So what he's what he's saying is is that at at the at the line level, you know, when you go to a production line, you're going to see OEE calculated at the production line, okay? And that OEE is broken down into availability, quality and performance, right? If the availability number is low, so what OEE is availability times quality times performance. If if the Availability number is low. It's driving the OE number down. You yell at the maintenance guy. If the quality number is low, you yell at engineering or the quality group or your OEM. If performance is low, you yell at operations. That's basically what it boils down to. The question he's asking is, is areas are groups of production lines. And so he's, he's saying, I've seen OEE at the area level calculated many ways. One way is people will average the three OEE numbers together. 
okay, to give you an area OE, area OEE line. That is not the way to do it, okay? It, it, now, it is a quick way of giving you area level OEE, but it is not the, the best practice. The best practice is you take the aggregation of all the minutes, so scheduled runtime in minutes, scheduled uh, unplanned downtime in minutes, planned downtime in minutes, the good parts versus total parts. You aggregate all those numbers and you do that calculation from the aggregates. Here's why. You could get a paradox. Well, what you do Simpsons is... Simpsons paradox. By, yeah, basically by... Exactly. Basically, by averaging the three together, you apply the same weight to all three lines. However, I may have a line that only ran for 10 minutes. And I may be averaging that with two lines that ran for eight hours. And what I would do is I may have had a bad 10 minute period. And so by averaging those three together, you, you are equalizing the weight of the three production lines artificially. And so that's why you do it from aggregates. But it's an outstanding question. That being said, that being said, sorry, Zach. That being said, I see them average together all the time. And what I will do is I will point out to the client, our team will point out to the client, this that you need to be aware that you are unfairly equalizing the weights of these production lines. And so therefore it's going to skew that output. But here's the point. If you are averaging them together in one area, you need to be averaging them together everywhere. Otherwise you are not doing an apples to apples comparison. But in, a, in, in general, don't average them together. You need to use aggregates. Go ahead, Zach. So in order to do that, the same OEE engine that you would run your line data through, you would run the sum of all of your lines through the, that area result set. You'd run that through your OEE engine. That's something we talked Correct. about a little bit. But um, the follow-up question is, that is how do you wait for the fact that machine A may make a product that's 10 times more valuable than machine B? Is there like a real cost OEE or a real so profit? So you do that at the ERP layer. So you bring that, you come up to the ERP layer and you retrieve what is known as a, uh, you, you calculate a value per percentage of OEE by machine. That's how you do that. And that is a, that's a completely separate number. It's not an OEE calculation. That's done at the finance level. It's a separate calculation, but it, it uses the OEE number to achieve it. Yep. Got it. Thanks. All right, Mr. Is it is his name Matt Paris? Is it Matt? Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. Okay. So Matt Paris um, asked a question. Was the partnership that formed in 2018 between PTC and Kepware and Rockwell an implicit announcement that Rockwell PLCs will never support IIoT protocols on board? Okay. Good question. This is an outstanding question. It's got a kind of a long answer, but it, the the answer is. No, that's not what it means. What it means is that Rockwell realized that they had they had been so focused on owning the stack, being completely vertically integrated, and then using products that they own at one layer in the automation stack to get you to buy products they own in the other ones that, in the other layers. They're trying to incentivize you to do that. They realized very quickly that there was a huge gap in their technology. Okay, there were, there were two gaps, but there was a huge gap. Gap number one was that Rockwell really did not have an IIoT platform in their stable. That is a platform where you could plug into an IIoT infrastructure that is you know, based on MQTT or DMB3, any of the report by exception protocols, or a unified namespace, and be able to like build dashboard solutions quickly in, in that platform. So that, that's where PTC's thing works comes in. So if you look at, I think they call it the factory talk innovation suite now, all factory talk innovation suite is, is thing works with a Rockwell logo on it. That's all it is. And that's the, that was the primary reason for that partnership. Okay. But at the same time, right, right before that partnership was announced, two years before that, PTC acquired Kepware. And the reason PTC acquired Kepware was because they realized they had a gap. Okay. Or wait, hold on a second. I want to go back. Gap number one was that Rockwell did not have an IoT platform. Gap number two was Rockwell really didn't have an efficient mechanism 
for sharing data from the their Rockwell stack to um, other pieces of software. Okay, and they and ThingWorks actually does that fairly well, so that's why they they did that billion dollar partnership. The downside is of that partnership is that all of the things that made PTC ThingWorks great pre Rockwell partnership they will be under continued pressure to not do those things anymore because Rockwell is a company that focuses on being vertically integrated. Rockwell tells their Rockwell partners, make it hard for Rockwell competitors to talk to your product. They do that as an actual strategy. That's an actual approach because Rockwell's focus is on getting you to buy all Rockwell products they don't care if their products are not great in some areas of the stack. In my opinion, Rockwell is only good at one thing, and that is PLCs. And that was Alan Bradley. That wasn't Rockwell. Okay. If you look at all the products that Rockwell Automation sells, there is only one product that product line that they sell that we believe can be, you can make the argument it's best in class. And that is their PLC lines specifically control logics, both safety and process automation. But I want to touch on one other point. PTC and Kepware, PTC acquired Kepware a year, maybe two years before the Rockwell partnership. Um, and the reason that PTC did that acquisition was because PTC realized they had one huge gap. They had a, a really huge gap in their suite of solutions. And that was no machine connectivity. In order for PTC to remain competitive and, and, not be, and be more than just a dashboarding solution, they had to have a way to talk to all the stuff on the plant floor. And that's why they bought Kepware. The downside of that acquisition is that PTC has made strategic decisions as it relates to Kepware and, and strategic decisions as it relates to ThingWorks that closes the platform and steers everyone towards the PTC suite of solutions. And they don't really take into consideration um, opening up their suite of solutions for non-PTC partners or non-Rockwell partners. Mm -hmm. They don't really think about that strategically. What they'll do is they'll quickly say, oh, if you want to talk to our PTC stuff, use MQTT, use OPC UA. Ne they never get to the point where they acknowledge that you have limited capability when you do that through their their solutions now. Go ahead, Zach. No way. So because the question comes up is, well, then why didn't uh, PTC just focus on being a great dashboarding solution and leverage the UNS to get edge connectivity? Because in node in an ecosystem. Because PTC the whole stack. PTC is in the business of selling licenses. Why does Tesla exist? The other Why did manufacturers oh, had a gap to, that, that to the accelerate the advent? No, what, is the, what, what is the what is the what is the mission of Tesla? To accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Okay, that is not PTC's mission. <laughs> okay, PTC does not have a mission that is has anything grander than the bottom line. And this is why it's not same thing with Rockwell because Rockwell has one Rockwell Automation has one mission and one mission only make the shareholders happy at the end of this quarter. Right. That's it. There's no mission beyond that. Well, the okay, mission that's is the profit, challenge, but they're, they're not, they're not honest about what those values are. And that's why they're not industry 4.0 is because industry 4.0 is 100% values based. And yes. Profit is not a value. That's number one, you know, that's a good uh, question. PT Matthew. Thank you. PTC will partner with anyone and everyone. Um, uh, JRS 89, more boring way to answer that area. Uh, yes. Uh, JRS 89 put in a, a good comment on the OEE. Uh, he used, he uses equations to show the flaw. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to Paul's question. How does someone assess the machine learning capabilities of a company? What types of questions bring about insights? Now, Paul, I'm going to answer this question from the perspective that you are asking me, how do, I, how do I assess the machine learning capabilities of someone who is selling a machine learning solution, okay? So that is, say that um, um, 
what is it? Expanse AI is the, uh, they're the guys that we're working with right now. Expanse.ai. Um, they've basically, they're using artificial intelligence to make machine learning easier. And it's a brilliant, brilliant platform that they've got. Uh, we love it. So I'm going to tell you the questions I asked them to evaluate what their capabilities were when they reached out and they said, Hey, we've got this expanse.ai. We've got this platform. Uh, we've got, you know, here's our intellectual property. This is our value in the market. And I asked them the, the following questions. Number one, walk me through the process of organizing your data for your model. So when you, when you have your, when you do your, your problem statement, which is I want to, I have high downtime on this, this uh, conveyor system. And to lower that downtime, I want to predict failures before they happen. Let's say, and, and I want to focus on these three failures. Okay. So that's the problem statement you're trying to solve. So what you do is you identify digital sensors, digital data that you can use for, say, your linear regression, right? So a linear regression would be for every value X, what is the, what based on my data, for every value X that I see on a sensor, what is the likely output Y? And at some point, Y equals failure. So at some threshold, Y equals that the bearing failed or Y equals that we've got a burst hydraulic hose or Y equals a pump went bad, right? Um, and we want to be able to predict that before it actually happens. So we want to see the trend that gets us there, right? That, that, that's an example of a machine learning model you would train in order to predict that. The training of the model is we create the model itself and then we use the historical data. We use the historical data to learn the patterns that we want the machine learning, the machine learning model to recognize. If I see this pattern, it means there's a 94% likelihood we have a hydraulic hose breaking in the next 15 minutes, right? That would be an output. So the question I asked them is, A, how do you acquire the data? In what format do you acquire that data? Okay. Number two, how do you structure the data? So that is what form does the structure of all of those events that I'm monitoring take? Because one of the things that machine learning uh, ML products have to do is they have to take data in the format you have it in your organization and put it in the format they need it in, in order for them to learn some context about your operations and then give you a model that you can use. And that model basically runs right alongside the actual state changes, the events that are happening on the plant floor. When it sees a pattern, it recognizes and it outputs, hey, you have a 94% likelihood hydraulic hose is going to break in 15 minutes. That, that's an example, right? So I ask him that. What, what format, how do you get it, acquire it, and what format do you put it in? The biggest question I ask him is this, though. How do you normalize unnormalized data? So that is, and no, here's normalization. If, if, if I'm monitoring two data points at my data point X, which is going to be, um, it's going to be actually, let's say it's two data points. It's an aggregation of a temperature of the hydraulic fluid and the, and the pressure of the hydraulic fluid. Okay. And the Y is the failure. That is that the, the hydraulic hose is going to fail. Okay. And I'm, I'm monitoring an aggregation and we have the Y, which is the likelihood of the failure. Um, the sensors, those two sensors that I'm using, temperature and, and pressure, they update at different rates. So that means every value change is going to have a different timestamp. So what you want to do is you want to get them normalized the best you can. That is, when the temperature was this temperature at this time, what was the pressure at the exact same time? Our systems don't collect the data like that, though. So I may see a timestamp of 12 o'clock and four seconds for pressure, and then a timestamp of 12 o'clock and um, six seconds for, for uh, temperature. And they may update at different rates, okay? One of the challenges that you have in machine learning is getting those normalized. So the normalization process is, giving you a pressure and a, and a temperature for each time in a time series data set, okay? That's called normalization. I ask them, how do you do that? That's a question you ask them. If they give you a deer and headlights look, 
run because it means that they have never run into an industrial machine learning problem before. They've never solved one because you wouldn't be able to solve it. You wouldn't be able to solve it without, without being able to normalize the data. Okay. Um, and it, here's the last one. Once you've got your data, it, once you've got your data um, um, normalized and collected, how long does it take you to teach the model? And how do you deploy what you've learned to the edge? That's the other question I ask. Mario asked, uh, hopefully that answered his question. Um, and hopefully I didn't lose a bunch of people there. Uh, I've seen at least failed to create any real market outcome. There you go. All right, uh, Mario, again, my, uh, I hope everything's fine there in Texas. It is, thank you. Um, yes, there are people here who have to boil the water and stuff. And there's been, you know, it was a rough week, but, um, you know, I read the national news. I mean, any, most Texans read the national news and roll their eyes. So it's not nearly as bad as the national news is telling you. Um, and by the way, and there's no one in Texas who's suggesting that we should connect our energy grid to the rest of the country. There's not a single person here who's saying we need to do that. Uh, Texans are Texans first and Americans second. So, uh, that's how Texans think. They do not identify as an American first. They identify as a Texan first. Um, but thank you for asking. Uh, can the tag browsing discovery along with the tag auto creation be used as a security threat by injection? So this is a question Mario asked earlier. I gave a quick answer in Discord. An example, an unwanted node is placed and misconfigured. This is in the unified namespace to an MQTT broker to create a lot of inserts on the historian to use all disk space or computer resources. In that case, TLS and proper security on the edge node would mitigate, but I wonder if this is a real threat and what are the best ways to avoid? So basically what he's saying is this, if I've got a unified namespace with a bunch of nodes connected and someone connects another node to the broker, is it a real risk that that person might stream data at too high of a rate that's going to for example, find its way into a SQL table or find its way into a historian. And it's basically like a denial of service attack. The answer is yes, that is a real risk. How do we mitigate it? We mitigate it through user roles. So we don't, al we don't allow open authentication against the broker, number one. So that is you always require username and password and you always use their, the user authentication to define what their role is uh, with the broker. Are they read only? Are they read write? Or, and specifically what topics they are allowed to read or write to. Okay, that's all done through the setup. So yes, that's how you mitigate it. What we say is this, is that when you are adding a node that is going to write information, not just consume, but it's gonna publish information to the unified namespace, you have to be diligent in applying the permissions that you apply to that node. It's not any different than your standard IT security practices, but it is a great question. Yes, it is a real threat, but it is easily mitigated through best practices. Um, all right, John McKeon. Hey all, does anyone know of a USB wireless dongle solution that can be deployed to connect a PLC to a machine wireless network, not limited to Wi-Fi, LoRa, or also other considered? All right, good question, McKeon. The answer is the, on a case-by-case -case basis. So yes, there are U wireless USB dongles that you can plug into PLCs, but you're going to have to buy a different one for each PLC because the PLC is going to have to house the driver itself, right? So, and I, I, I popped an example up here for you. If you look at uh, Amazon, you can go on Amazon and buy a, uh, a serial to USB dongle for an S7200, for example. There are many examples out there. Okay, but they are on a case by case basis, with the exception of um, the Opto 22, you would be able to do a direct plug in because of the OS that runs on Opto 22. There's native drivers built in. That's a very good question, though. Uh, Pat Patton J2 said question on an ignition canary integration. How do ignition tag properties map to canary tag properties? I'm specifically wanting at a minimum to have description and units of measure be able to be configured in one place, ideally as close to the source as possible. All right. So what he's saying here is 
for those of you that don't know ignition, this won't mean anything, but ignition, a tag inside of ignition has many properties. So you know, you have tag object dot value will give you the current value dot timestamp will give you the timestamp of the, when the value changed dot documentation is basically a string field that I could populate anything in there. If I wanted to, there's units of measure. So dot U O M. If I have that in there, I can type in what the unit of measure is. He's saying, he's asking the question, how do those map into Canary? The answer is they don't because those are not historized. The dot value is what's historized. But the way that we solve that problem is we create a user-defined data type. We use a base data type, which I've showed everyone how we do this. We create a base Boolean. We create a base float, a base int. Sometimes what we do in those base is we create a memory tag that has that unit of measure. And then the property in the tag is mapped to the memory tag. So what it would look like is something like this. I have a, a tag, my tag object, and it's a UDT. So the, and, and I'm going to have a memory tag inside of that user-defined type that is memory unit of measure, memory, uh, what was it, description. And then, in, so in the parent tag, the dot, the dot description retrieves its value from memory description. And the dot unit of measure, what's that? Can you increase the font size a little bit? Oh, sorry. Uh, and then what we do is, because this is a tag, because these are tags here, we historize those. Okay? And so then you've got them both available, unit of measure and description in the historian. The, the, the challenge you have is that you don't, in a historian, you don't historize the tag object from ignition. You historize the value and the timestamp, which are only two parameters of a tag object. Tag.value, tag.timestamp gives you your history. Is he wanting to know the history of when the memory description or when the unit of measure changed? Or is he just wanting to query Canary, get the value, and also the contextual data such as... Correct. You know, That's what oh. it sounds like. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. So uh, Matt Paris, let me skip over that one real quick. And then I'll go... We may have to do that one next week because it's a long answer. Uh, Hesh R said... Uh, you watched an interesting video on data distribution service. I want to make sure I touch on this. Positioned as the industry for uh, data infrastructure, it'd be great to get your thoughts, real world application. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer you guys to this white paper. Um, we'll put the link in the description here. And I want you to go ahead and read. It's DDS versus MQTT, okay? I want, I want everyone to understand what DDS is, okay? And so that I can then answer your question on how it compares to MQTT. Here's the answer in a nutshell. So you'll on page one, you guys will read the data distribution service, what a data distribution service is, and then what is MQTT. Um, in a nutshell, a data distribution service is middleware that is pub sub, okay? In a, in a nutshell, it's middleware that is pub sub. Here's the problem with it. The problem is, is that it's heavyweight, very heavyweight. It's very verbose and it's not, it's not lightweight in any way, shape or form. And one of our minimum technical requirements for your IIoT infrastructure is lightweight. Is a data distribution service open architecture? It can be, it, but there are, there are some of them that are not open. Okay. Um, that is, it, it's a, the, the protocol interaction, the, the transport layer is open, but the protocol is not. Okay. Um, a data, dis a, a good example of a data distribution service would be, um, it would be similar to like a TIBCO data bus on steroids. That's a DDS. And the answer is no, it cannot, it does it has server role in industry 4.0. Yes really robust networks where I'm, I'm passing, you know, wholly object oriented models. Yes. Then the DDS is going to serve a purpose, but it is not going to be the backbone of your IOT infrastructure. But what we're going to do is we're going to include this document 
you guys can go ahead and read the analysis here. Positives, negatives, et cetera, et cetera. What I will say is this paper does not in take into account the spark plug B specification for MQTT. So what they're comparing here is flat MQTT, or as most of you guys know, vanilla MQTT version 3.1.1 and, uh, and a data distribution service, but uh, outstanding question. Um, the, I think their conclusion is that DDS is the, the way of the future. Let me see. Can't remember. Uh, yeah, it just, it, it, it gives you a generic, uh, answer. Given the results of the comparison, there's a good reason to choose each for the, of the three, given a specific use case. Um, but, uh, the, the, where this paper falls short is it doesn't take into account spark plug B. So encryption and, and, uh, um, encryption, compression, um, et cetera. Uh, and then I think the last one's going to be Tulip. Okay. Oh, Walker, can you share that link in the Discord real quick? Just so anyone listening or anyone oh, yeah, yeah. watching after can... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and drop it in right now. Which channel can people find it in? The, wait, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, drop it in the YouTube chat and then you can grab it. Okay. I'll put it in the unified namespace channel for you guys. Yep. Um, and I, I want to, uh, so two questions that we'll do next week. I'm going to answer Matt Paris's long question about architecture, basically migrating, you know, um, to a, a, a new architecture. The short answer to your question, Matt Paris, if you're watching QOS two with the retain flag set is going to be sufficient on the history side. What I'm going to answer is, um, how do historians, he asks the question, when you have a historian connect to an MQTT broker, what do you do about disconnects? The answer is store and forward. So basically what a historian will do, what the node will do is it'll stream all the events through the broker and into the historian once the connection's re reestablished. So say I've got like 10 tag changes that happened while I was disconnected. Um, when I reconnect, it's going to, it's going to do all 10 of those, um, those publishes right in a row and and the last value the last uh element in the array will be the current value this is one of the beauties of mqtt it's one of the advantages over opc ua is that mqtt out of the box the timestamp comes from the edge it's originated from the edge so we're never we're not storing the timestamp server side so i could using an mqtt broker I could store my history for an entire day somewhere and then stream it through a broker at midnight when I've got low network traffic to get all of that into the historian and the timestamps would line up as if it, the historian was monitoring it in real time because the timestamp originates from the edge, from the actual event itself. But that's the short answer to your question, Matt. But I, I will do a longer answer and then I will, next week we'll, we'll talk about tulip.io, okay? Uh, which is an IoT platform. A couple questions came in. Uh, yep. Steven Egan in the YouTube chat said, Hey Walker, when doing predictive analytics, do you declare variables for the components age, date, when new, for example? Yep. Yep. So what we do, and, and we do this on the edge, our user, to, the UDT that lines up to that sensor has an install date, serial number, model number, who installed it, all that. So he said, so if you're trying to predict mean time to failure, the component is new at a certain date. So if so, how do you handle to reset the variable when it is replaced? Hope we do sensor. that on the, in the SCADA layer. So on the, ten, on the faceplate for the sensor in the SCADA system, we open the faceplate and change the sensor. So there's a button, installed new sensor, and then generally we'll have a comment or something, you know, installed by so-and-so. Long term, and we've never done this yet, actually, Long term, what we want to do is get that from the CMMS, but we, we, we have the connections with the CMMS, but we've never actually taken that event from the CMMS. I have a question. Sure. Why not just have it edge driven? Like why not have the sensor announce itself in the, we, that we te the, we've tested that some sensors, right? So if you're using like BNB SmartWorks sensors, you, you, there's enough context from the raw sensor to the puck so that you know that's a brand new sensor. 
But a analog sensor that's like just a four to yeah, twenty with two wires, happen. there's no context. But right, right. if it's a heart, right? If it's a heart device, there's that context across the uh, across the protocol. So the, to answer your question, Zach, long term, once we change the sensor, the sensor will, especially once everyone, you know, OEMs are providing OEMs are providing that context from the sensor, right? The sensor is actually smart, and it can tell us the serial numbers stored on a EEPROM on the, on the device itself, it, that'll all be edge driven right now. The way we do it is through a faceplate. If someone makes a change to a sensor changes out of four to 20, you go to that faceplate and say changed out. And now we've got that context, but yes, outstanding last question, question Stephen. Well, yeah. Last question before we get off here, Mr. Man, uh, Mr. Man Monto said, any thoughts on influx DB as a historian? I feel like it has the power to be one. And if it could interact with MQTT more neatly, that would be nice. The answer is it see the board behind me right here. That's the influx DB is the historian I'm running on that board. So um, the data the, would like a Q and a or a video on data parameters and timestamp questions. Oh, that that's a great idea, Cheryl. Um, yes. To answer your question, influx DB, by the way, um, started out as a DevOps. I mean, they still are a DevOps company. That is they created the technology that they sell to other companies so that they can sell historians. So um you know, there are many people out there who use InfluxDB as the actual historian, but it's, it's white labeled and it's called something else. Um, but InfluxDB is actually running on a Raspberry Pi with Grafana um, on, that, uh, on that board behind me. That's uh, the actual local historian I'm using. All right, guys. Thank you, uh, Anders. Appreciate you guys. Questions. Thank you guys for coming uh, to the live stream, showing up live. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like. And check out the Digital Factory Mastermind program. If you do see that board behind Walker's head right there, we dive deep into building a unified namespace, connecting to ERP, connecting to Historian, which we did a few weeks ago. So join the Mastermind, click that link below, and you're supporting this, this right here. So thank you guys. I'm going to answer, I'm gonna answer one more question before we drop off real quick. Uh, so Ragu uh, asks, can you please comment on how the redundancy server in Ignition works? Is there a notification when the redundant server syncs with the primary server so that we manually switch over to the primary? The answer is yes. Um, that's available in the tags inside of Ignition. So there is a there there are tags that'll tell you which of the Igni Ignition redundant ser redundant servers are active. Are they are they active and which one is the primary? You can actually monitor that from the tags. If that isn't a sufficient answer, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll. Uh, you know, I'll answer it deeply in another video. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. Dan Riken, Sir Riken, <laughs> Lieutenant Dan, thank you for joining us. I hope it was, I hope it was fun for you. A total blast. Awesome, brother. Appreciate yeah. you. Thank guys, you. We'll see you guys next week. We'll have uh, Dave Schultz on the Q&A spotlight. We will see you guys Friday in the, in the Digital Transformation Maturity Assessment webinar. All right.